The title of the message is Hannah's Road to Rejoicing. Hannah's Road to Rejoicing. Our text will be 18 verses, so it's a long passage uh, for us anyway. It'll be 1 Samuel 1, 1 to 18. But before we go there, let's do what you do when you're all excited about a mystery book. You run right to the back of the book. I didn't ever do this, but this is what people do. They run right to the end and find out how it all ended. So let's do that. We'll find the conclusion first, and then we'll find out how we lead up to it. So chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. She's got rejoicing twice. She's got a double scoop of it. (laughs) Twice in that verse she's rejoicing. But she didn't start out rejoicing. We'll find her beginning and how she works her way up to the rejoicing. So 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1. This is a great memory verse for anybody but me. 1 Samuel 1, verse 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathamazophim. That. <laughs> that is a long word. Of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah. And uh, Elkanah, the son of uh, Jerah, Jerohim, the son of Elihu the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephrathite. Okay, verse 2. Now we'll get back to English. (laughs) And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, the name of the other, Penanna. And Penanna had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his uh, up out of the, his city yearly to worship, and to sacrifice unto the Lord of Hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phineas, the priests of the Lord, were there. That's bad news. And when the time was that El that Elhannah, off Elkanah, Elkanah, Elkanah. There we go. Elkanah. That's it. Elkanah offered. He gave to. Penina, Pen, that woman, <laughs> his wife, uh, and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb, and her adversary, now she's got a new name, not wife, it's adversary, <laughs> and her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as she did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, 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 y'all have to keep telling me how to say this. Then said Elkanah, uh, her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? Dry it up, woman. (laughs) And why eatest thou not? Why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? Talk about a tough man. (laughs) He's laying down the law right here. (laughs) I don't care if you're hurt. Get over it quick. Verse (laughs) 9. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said... O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and wilt remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunk, drunken. She's a wino, he thought. Verse 14. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, O my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial. So you drink alcohol. The proper definition of that is you're a daughter of Belial if you're a woman. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, 
and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. Okay, great story. Now, as I read that story, I'm going to show you my problem. As I read that story, my mind has already decided how this story is supposed to play out. I've read the Bible through so many times that when I get to a new book, I know the stories that are in the book. And that doesn't mean I enjoy it any less. I love it. However, I've already got some preconceived notions of what's going to be there. That's what just throws you off if you... I've been listening through the Bible and not in order. And it just messes with your mind because you're used to, you know, after Genesis comes Exodus. And when it doesn't, it just throws you off, makes you listen up. <laughs> However, in my mind, and I guess this is from just Sunday school days or something, flannel graph charts or something. But in my mind, the story plays out this way. They're walking into the temple and they're offering something, an offering. But that's not, they're not given an offering. It's not money. It's not cash. And they're not going into the temple. So that's in my mind, you know, the notion is they go into the temple and Hannah kneels down at the altar. Uh, well, there's no place for her to kneel in the temple anyway. And uh, Eli, uh, what's his name? Uh, Eli. Eli. Y'all preach this for me. Then, and Eli sees her over there and says, Okay, that woman needs some dealing with. She'd been over there praying for a while. I'm going to go over there and help her. And he says, woman, you know, you've probably been drunk. Well, now, that's not the details of the Bible. That's a, an imagination. And you'll find that as you go through the Bible, you'll find that the details, if you pay attention, will teach you a different story than your mind has conceived. So let's notice the problems that we see with our passage. The first problem, and this is blatantly obvious, is in verse 2. Two wives. Two wives. Whew. What an idiot. <laughs> it's going to take you a lifetime to figure out how to communicate and get along with one. Why would you add another one to the mix? Stupid. Now, I know why he did it. I know why he did it. He did it because he wanted children. That was a big thing back then, was you needed to pass on your name. You needed to reproduce. If you couldn't reproduce, here's what he did. He went out and got him another wife. Now, I don't know which one is first and second, but more than likely, Hannah was first. She's listed first. The second one comes along because she can bear children. She bears children. If she couldn't have bore children, there would have been a third. I don't know that for sure, but I'm just saying that's the way it's playing out anyway. God didn't intend man to do this. He didn't intend for man to have multiple wives. There's no way around that. It's just plain in the Bible if you read your Bible with your eyes open. In Genesis 20, uh, 2, verse 24, Genesis 2, 24, he says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, singular, not plural, and they shall be one flesh. So it's singular wife, one, not many, one. Every time a man multiplies wives, he multiplies problems, biblically. You can see God's curse on that. God doesn't want multiple wives. In Deuteronomy 17:17, 17, 17, the Bible says, talking about when you appoint a king in Israel, Deuteronomy 17, 17. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. So he says, if you're going to have a king in Israel, he's going to represent my ideal of everything that's right. And I'll tell you just plainly, my ideal of right is not multiple wives. It's single wife. That's clear. Now... I understand the people who that appeals to say, but he didn't say everybody, that was just the king. Okay, well, who starts out saying, I don't want the best, I want to be a loser? Really? I mean, when you go to a job, you say, what's the highest I can make here? 
you're not going to start out at that number. You're going to have to work your way up to it. But your goal is to get to the best. You don't start out saying, I, I want just a little under minimum wage. You're paying everybody minimum wage? I'm not worried about that. Just give me $2 an hour. <laughs> no, you want the best. Well, guess what? God just told what his idea of the best is. One wife. Uh, in Ephesians 4, verse 4. This is a no-brainer. You already know this. I don't know why I'm giving you all these references. Maybe you'll run into somebody that you need to give these references to. Ephesians 4, verse 4. There is one body, singular, and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. Salvation is a picture of this thing we call marriage. We have been married to Jesus Christ, and he's not married to multiple women. One body. We're all put into one singular body. He's married to one bride. In Ephesians 5.23, for the husband is the head of the church, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of singular, the body. One. First Timothy 3, 2. I could give you more, but I'll stop here. First Timothy 3, 2. A bishop then must be blameless. We talked about a bishop. Okay, that's somebody that God's saying I'm putting in charge because I, I think they're doing a good job. So you should be able to emulate them. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober of good behavior, given to, uh, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Okay, so we saw right there, there's a problem. Right off the bat, there is a problem because he's got two of these women and not one. Furthermore, if you'll do the, the research, I've done it before and I think I've given it to everybody, that this guy's actually a Levite himself. He's from the tribe of Levi. Now, that tells you what's going on in Israel at this time. There's only one person doing any work of the Lord, and that's Eli and his family. But it shouldn't be that way. All the Levites have a job to be done, and this guy's not doing his job. He just goes up once a year. That's not the way it works. Go to Leviticus and you find they all have a function they're supposed to be doing all of the time, all year round. You're not a Levite because you get to take it easy. You're a Levite because God intends you to work. But he wasn't doing it. Uh, in verse 3, verse 3, And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship. Verse 7, and as he did so year by year. Okay, he goes to the, the celebration. The main event is Easter and Christmas, and that's when he shows up. Only for him, it, it's only one time a year. Once in the year, he shows up to church. That's it. Because that's the big event. I was talking about it with Toby today. My generation, they wanted to go to church on the main event. Easter and Christmas. This next generation that's coming along don't care anything about that. They don't go to church, period. They don't care about Easter and Christmas. You know how that de de degenerated into that? My, the people that came before me, the generation before me, were strict about we go to church every time the doors open. You know what happened to the generation, my generation? They said, hey, we don't need all of that every, I mean, we're, we already know it all. So we'll just go to the main event to show everybody we are Christian, and then we'll get to meet up with the people we had not seen in a while, and, you know, whatever, whatever, we'll make a good show. So the next generation has to do the same the ones before them did, cut it even less. They don't even go to church. Okay, that's what this guy's done. He says, I'm just going to show up once a year. You know what the Bible says? Let's find it. Exodus 23, 14. Exodus 23, 14. Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. What's he doing just showing up once? It says three times. Well, maybe he didn't have that, you know, that part of the scroll was missing from his... <laughs> from his library. So let's look at it in Exodus twenty-three seventeen. 
three times in a year. All thy males shall appear before the Lord God. Well, maybe that one was missing too. Look at Exodus thirty-four twenty-three. Exodus thirty-four twenty-three. Thrice in the year shall all your men children appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. Hmm. Maybe he had a modern scroll and it wasn't in that one. Deuteronomy sixteen sixteen. <laughs> Deuteronomy sixteen sixteen. Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, in the feasts of unleavened bread, and in the feast of weeks, and in the feast of tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Wow. He's just blatantly rebelled against God. That's what he's done. Now God says three times in the year every male is to show up. He didn't say the women had to come. They're welcome to come, but the men had better be there. That's Bible. It's what God said. Now, you know what we do? We take a, we're not commanded to observe all of those things. But we do something similar as a picture of that. We say, in one week, we'll show up to church three times. But you know what this man did? He said, nah. Let's get rid of that Sunday night service, and we really don't need a Wednesday night. Let's just have one big event on Sunday, and we'll pull out the strobe lights, and it'll be a feast, and everybody will have a good time. Uh, God said three times. Three times. So that's what we try to do that. Well, this guy's a Levite. He should have known better. We know he did know better. He just didn't do better. He's got two wives. That's a mark against him. He only shows up once in the year. That's a mark against him. Let's see what else is um, a perceived problem in our passage here. Look at verse 3. Uh, 1 Samuel 1, verse 3. Eli sat. Uh-oh. <laughs> verse 3, Hophni and Phinehas. Now, that's bad news. When those two boys show up, you know trouble's going to follow. I mean, just... Those are the bad news bears right there. Verse 9. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. You see a problem with that? As I read that, it just jumped out at me and said, Hey, look, the boys are in there doing the work. And Eli is sitting out on the lazy boy, chit-chatting with the folks that he hadn't seen in a year, and having a good time. Now... That's me just reading it without enough Bible. And I'm sure you probably thought the same thing when I just said that, unless you've got enough of Leviticus in your mind. But he's doing exactly the way the Bible said it was supposed to be done. It was the boys who were supposed to do this, and Eli was not supposed to be involved. That's amazing. The Bible will blow your mind. Leviticus 1, verse 7. Leviticus 1, verse 7. And the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. And the priests, Aaron's sons, shall lay the parts, the head, so forth, so on. And there you see it. Aaron had sons. Aaron wasn't doing this work. The boys were. Okay, who's our high priest? Jesus Christ. You know who's doing the physical work down here? We are. At his direction. So the boys are supposed to be working. Eli's not necessarily supposed to be the one seen doing the work. So it works, but it sure was anti what I thought. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 8. Leviticus 8 verse 12. And he poured the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. And Moses brought Aaron's sons and put coats upon them and girded them with girdles and put bonnets upon them as the Lord commanded Moses. So the boys are not just any old boys. <clears throat> They've been sanctified, purified, set apart, and uh, prepared to do this job. And so they're supposed to be doing a job. And it's not just anybody in the the crowd can come up and fulfill this mission. 
The sons were there. God gave him sons for a reason. He's going to use them. Hophni and Phinehas were in a great position. They were going to mimic exactly what was going on with Aaron and his sons. They could have, but they didn't. Look at it in Deuteronomy 12. Deuteronomy 12, verse 11. It says, then, sh then, shall, uh, then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. Whether shall uh, ye bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, all your choice vows. Vows? Now, we're going to find a vow that we read about in uh, 1 Samuel. So vows show up here. Vows which ye vow unto the Lord, and ye shall rejoice, that's what we were talking about, rejoicing, before the Lord your God, ye, your sons, your daughters, your manservants, your maidservants, uh, dogs and cats and cows and all that. Verse 13, <laughs> Take heed to thyself that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place that thou seest, but in the place which the Lord shall choose in one of the tribes, there thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, and there thou shalt do all that I command thee. So he did come up, and he came to the right place. He just didn't do it often enough. Should have done it three times a year. Now this, when did he show up? I don't know. He just did it once a year. He chose one of the three feasts to be his feast that he would go up to every year. I don't know which one, but I do think that this became a habit amongst all Israel. I think they all started doing this. Hey, you know, three times is a little excessive. We're not a fanatic. Let's just do it once. Well, you're going to be there. That's I'm right. There yeah, yeah. Just once a year is plenty. And so that started catching on. You start dropping your services, it's going to catch on. It's not going to multiply in a good direction. It's going to multiply in a bad direction. Look at it in Luke 2, verse 41. Luke 2, verse 41. Luke 2 and verse 41. He says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year. Sound familiar, doesn't it? Once a year. At the Feast of Passover. Okay. <clears throat> so once a year at Passover, that was the biggie. So we'll just show up for the biggie. And we'll let those minor ones slide. He did it once a year, probably at Passover. We can see that pick up again all the way through the Bible. It's Passover becomes the biggie. And so that's probably what he's doing here. Don't let the little things slip. You need all three. Do them all three. Now back to Hannah. Uh... <clears throat> Hannah, in verse 2, has a real problem. A perceived problem. It ain't just perceived. It's literal. Verse 2, Hannah had no children. That's a big deal, especially in her day and age. That was a woman's worth was her children. She didn't have any children. She didn't have any value. She had, this Hannah girl, she had a legitimate, humanly speaking, a legitimate grievance with Elkanah, her husband. She should have a grievance with him. I mean, I would. If I was Hannah, I would have a problem with my husband because he decided to get a new wife. Now, when he decided to get a new wife, she didn't suddenly become a bitter old woman. And I don't know how. It must have been God. You know what she didn't say to him? She didn't say to him, I know you've got to get another wife because you want children, but hey, look at it. Ain't I better than ten children? That's what he told her. Yeah. She didn't use that line on him. She stayed in submission in a tough time. Good woman. She had a legitimate grievance with the new woman. <laughs> Penina. Verse 6. Her adversary also provoked her. <laughs> She wasn't just uh, the new furniture in the house. She was an adversary. They had problems. Well, that's, that's a no-brainer. You know, if you've if you got two women in there, they ain't going to get along for very long. 
It just needs to be when the mother-in-law comes in, she's there for an hour, and then the, the party's over. Go home. <laughs> Don't make her stay all year, all year round. There's going to be some fur flying. <laughs> Verse 7. And as he did so year by year, so this same thing's happening every year, so uh, uh, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she, that's the other woman, provoked her, Hannah. Therefore, because of that, she wept and did not eat. Now, I think from that verse right there, this happens every year. What's supposed to be a great feast that they're going to, every year Hannah cannot enjoy it. She goes up there, and Penina gets to pray around her children. And everybody makes over the children. Oh, they've really grown in a year. It's been so... And it's rubbed in the nose of Hannah. Hannah's grieved, and what's supposed to be a big party in Israel is not fun for her. It's grievous. Matter of fact, so much that she can't even eat. This is when you're supposed to do the most eating. We come to the buffet, buddy. <laughs> but she's got no appetite. She had a legitimate grievance with God. Verse 6. And her adversary also provoked her sore uh, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. Hmm. We get down to the root cause. It was God's fault she didn't have children. It wasn't her fault. It wasn't her husband's fault. God opens and closes the womb at choice, at his choice. The real issue was God. Now, she doesn't become a bitter, uh, spiteful old woman. She handles things the right way. More power to her. I don't know that I would have been a Hannah. <laughs> but Hannah handled things the right way. <clears throat> she noticed, point two, the issue is posterity, not prosperity. Now, those words sound similar, but they're not. Posterity. That's your lineage. That's your name. That's your line that goes ahead of you or after you. Well, however you want to say it. <laughs> your children. Your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, all that. It's the posterity. That's something future. You know what Penina was all excited about? Prosperity right here and now. She goes up to the feast and everybody can see her children. That's what it's all about. But Hannah realized, hey, it's not about what's here and now. It's about something future, bigger. Let's plan for something in the, in the future. Post, uh, prosperity um, is something you can spend right now. If you got a lot of money, you're prosperous. That means you have the ability to go out and buy you some goodies. Go ahead and get some junk. Posterity is, good. Posterity is going to look to the future, something way beyond when I'm not even here anymore. On the other side, the closed womb was a reservation for a future need. God closed that womb on purpose. He said, it's not time right now. He didn't say never. He just said, for right now, it's not time yet. I know exactly when the right time is going to be. And it's going to be better than you can imagine. But until that time, doors closed. No one remembers the names of Penina's children. Who were they? How many boys were there and how many girls were there? We don't have a clue. But all of Israel and all Christendom knows the name of Samuel. Okay, God's timing worked out perfect. It sure didn't feel too perfect at the time. But it always is, always. Point three is her petition. It's a petition, not pretense. That's the view we get of Penina. She went up there with pretense. She went up there for everybody to look at her and praise her, and it was all about her, and she's going to put down somebody else. She must have really had a bad, low self-esteem. <laughs> that People that put somebody else down... It's not because they feel like they're high and mighty. It's feel like they feel like they're low, and they've got to do that to make themselves feel like they've climbed up a rung or two. We know in our story that the husband here really loved Hannah. 
The second wife was not because he loved her. It's because he loved the idea of getting children. It didn't have anything to do with her. So I think that she's just uh, rubbing it in her nose every time she can. But really, in essence, she feels like she's not loved. And probably that was the fact. Penina was greedy, spending the welfare of God's goodness while Hannah was working overtime for a bigger payday. You know, when you go to work and you work, let's say you work 30 hours a week and you get a paycheck, that's good. And it feels like that 30 hours wasn't that bad. You get the end of 30 hours and you get your paycheck. If you'll go to work and work 12 hours a day, it feels like that paycheck ain't coming. Those are long, hard days. But guess what? When you get the paycheck, when you finally get it, when the 5,000 hours have finished and you can finally go collect your paycheck, it's a big deal because it's a big paycheck. That's what we find in our story. Penina was being able to collect her paycheck left any time she wanted a child, she got a child. And she could go up and show everybody and brag about them, but not Hannah. Hannah's what, waiting. And she doesn't have a paycheck she can go cash. Well, she's going to have one, and when she gets it, it's going to be a big one. Look at it in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. It's got to be done that way. When the soul becomes bitter, and I don't mean animosity, but it becomes hurt, hurt, uh, pained, then the place to take it is prayer. Talk to God. I was telling uh, Chris the other day, one of the things that I notice about this younger generation is they never go outside. They don't know what's on the other side of those doors. Now, the way they know it is because the video game showed them a virtual reality. You know what? You know what you don't see from virtual reality that is instinctively known by real reality? Is God. Wednesday, I think it was, it had been rain or something, and, and then it was a beautiful day on Wednesday. I went outside, perfect temperature, a light breeze. And just instinctively, without trying to be super spiritual or Christian or any of that stuff, my mind just said, wow, God, you did a good job. Thank you. Okay? You know God from what he's created. This modern generation doesn't. The computer doesn't tell you God when you look at virtual reality. But he will when you walk out the door. we got to go to God. Pray. Pray. When problems show up, pray. Take it to the one that matters. In verse 11, and she vowed a vow. Now, she's more on the ball than the rest of her family. The place you're supposed to vow a vow is right where she is. And it's this time of year you're supposed to do it. We read that in Deuteronomy. So she's doing everything by the book the way she should. She probably knows more of the Bible than the rest of the family does. At least she sure is adhering to more of it. Uh, look down in our verse. Um, she says, um, and said, O Lord of hosts. Now this is the first time that name shows up, Lord of hosts. Um, she's recognizing God as bigger than anything that you can imagine. Host is an army. That's, he's the top general, and he's in charge. And he is. And she's taking her petition right to the one that matters, the Lord of hosts. Nobody can conquer him. If thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, uh-oh, she just used a key phrase he loves. Affliction. Remember when he brought them out of Egypt? He said, I looked at their affliction. They were afflicted in chains. It's always affliction that gets God's attention. Sometimes life begins to afflict you and you feel like you're in affliction, use it. Don't let it go by. Use it. That gets God's attention. Tell him I'm being afflicted. He's the Lord of hosts. 
the big general can, can solve it. And remember me, and, and uh, not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will. Think about this. This is crazy. She said, if you would just give me now, so we can understand it, let's take the child part out of it. And let's say I say, if you will just give me $10,000, I'll give you back $10,000. What did I gain? Zero. She says, I'll give him right back to you. All the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. I'll be sure nothing happens to that $10,000. You'll get it back in a bow and wrapped and shrink wrapped and it'll be perfect. I'll take it next door and get it laundered and <laughs> it'll be clean. <laughs> That's what she's saying here. I'm not going to let anything happen to him and I'm going to give him right back to you. What did she gain? She's not in it for herself. There's a bigger picture here. Now, God moved on her to do all this because that's not normal human behavior. Look at it in verse 17. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. She's planning. She started out praying, and then she said, Beyond just asking for help, let me start planning what's going to happen when I do get the help. You know, we don't pray that way often, but we need to. We need to pray and thank him for solving the problem. Not just praying to say there is a problem. Now let's have some confidence in his ability. He's the Lord of hosts. Now let's pray and say, now when you, when you do answer this, I want to do it right. Here's the way we're gonna, I'm going to proceed. That's what he's doing. She's doing right here. She's planning. Um, look at verse 18. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. The problem wasn't solved, but it was in her mind. In her mind, she knew God took care of it. We can get the same thing. Okay, she did a couple of steps here. She prayed, she did some planning, and now she's doing some praising. All three of those will help you. That will lead to rejoicing. Look at it in verse 19. In verse 19. Did I read verse 18? Yes, yes okay, verse 19. <laughs> and they rose up in the, uh, in the morning early. Well, that wouldn't make you praise, but... <laughs> and they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Okay, now she can finally eat. She can finally worship. She can finally enjoy the reason she had come to begin with, the reason for the feast. Because now there's nothing weighing on her. She's already delivered it to God. She's already planned that she's going to do right with it when he answers. And she's already been praising him for it. What that leads to is rejoicing. When you start viewing God as the answer to your prayer, not as a genie in a bottle, but as the actual answer to the prayer, it changes your attitude. Then you suddenly rejoice without thinking about it. Chapter 2, verse 1, we find her rejoicing twice. We saw the double dip of rejoicing. Let's, in conclusion, see what kind of a, a, a marvelous thing this turned into. She gives a prayer here. This is Hannah's prayer in chapter 2. That'll just blow your mind. It shows you all the turmoil and the trouble she had to go through. And where it led to when you handle it the correct way. Look at verse 3. Verse 3. Now, I'm assuming here that many times she's addressing the other woman. But it, I know this is a prophetic passage as well. But you can see the other woman sitting in the corner as Hannah begins to give a little sermonette here. <laughs> Verse 3. Talk no more so exceedingly proud. Uh, 
I'm talking to you, woman. <laughs> Let not arrogancy come out of, the, uh, out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. You remember every year when we went up to the feast? You had plenty of actions you were doing, and God got the scales out, and they are weighed. Verse 4. Uh, the bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumble are girded with strength. <laughs> you thought I was the weaky. I was the weakling. Well, God had a trick in his, up his sleeve for you. Verse 5. They that were filled have hired out themselves for bread. Now, I don't know how that fits with the other woman, but it sounds like she's an outcast now. She's hiring herself out for bread. And they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren, who's the barren? That was Hannah, hath borne seven. We know how many she's got. She's got seven now. You give something to God, he gives back. He doesn't take any welfare. <laughs> he overpays you for whatever it is you gave him. So it's, it's a good deal. Here she's got seven when she promised to give back one to God that he gave her. He dumps out seven. And she that hath many children, the other woman, is waxed feeble. Now, I'm sure that bearing children was hard on the women back then. They didn't have all the modern medicine we have, and they didn't have air conditioners and heaters and, you know, all the conveniences we do. So it's rough on their body. Sounds like this woman was having one child right after the next. So it looks like in our story that this woman's health has gone right downhill. Where she thought she was on the top of the world, her world crumbled quickly. Life is this way. Every good story is this way. You don't go watch a movie and want to see, oh, the rich man's winning, and he just keeps on winning. Where's the climax in that? <laughs> you want to see it starts from the bottom, and you work hard, and you work hard, and it finally goes up, and up. that's life. And it works the other way, too. If you want everything right now and you demand it, it's going to move one direction. And you've already been to the top, so the only thing left for you to do is move back. And that's what this lady does. She had all the children. She had all the fame. Now she's going the other direction. She's waxed feeble. Verse 6. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. Remember that Lord of hosts I was talking about? That's him right there. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the thrones of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. He will, keep his feet, uh, he will keep the feet of his saints. The wicked shall be si silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto, the king, uh, unto his king, and shall exalt the horn of his anointed. This is Hannah's prayer. And her praise. She got exactly what she really wanted her whole time. She got the rejoicing. She got the child. And she got children. But it sure wasn't easy getting there. Guess what? We want some things in life too. We want, I'm not just talking about the way the world wants them. We want some things spiritually in this life. And you should. But guess what? You're not just going to snap your finger. And everything's going to fall into place the way it's supposed to. Even if your desires are correct. Hannah's desires were right. She needed a child. It's this child right here, Samuel, who's going to anoint God's king, David. But it didn't just snap her fingers and everything fell right into place. She had to go through it, and she had to do it right. She had to have the right attitudes, and she had to follow through the way God says to do things, and it worked out fine. For us, it'll be the same way. Hannah's road to rejoicing can be ours, if we'll follow the steps she took.